First, Jesus instructed Nicodemus regarding the prerequisite of being born again in order to see and also to enter the kingdom of God, John 3, 3 and 5. He next pointed to another necessity in relation to new life and receiving eternal life. And again, bear in mind what we're looking at this morning in verses 16 to 18 is, is only a portion of Jesus's conversation with Nicodemus from John chapter 3. Uh, the conversation actually goes from verse 1 to 21. But what we know here is, is God's love and humanity's need. Two, two things that are great. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. People have their favorites, but this text has been called everybody's text. Does it not truly reflect the, the gist or the heart of the gospel message? It has even been, been noted in, in looking at this, uh, this verse briefly, John 3, 16, as for God, the greatest lover, so loved, that is the greatest degree, the world, the greatest company, that he gave the greatest act, his only begotten son, the greatest gift, that whoever, the greatest opportunity, believes the greatest simplicity, in him the greatest attraction, should not perish the greatest promise, but the greatest difference, have the greatest certainty, everlasting life, the greatest possession. Two things which are great that are noted in this first in, in verse 16 of John 3. John 3, 16 is God's great love. He is the great initiator of the hope of salvation. As Paul was writing to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 4 through 5, there he said, But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And then John in 1 John 4, 9 through 10 said, In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Jesus, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. That's how much God loved us, that he sent his son. And that great love was extended to meet our greatest need. And that is the need of sin that separates us from God. Romans 3, 23 to 24, Paul noted this is the reality for all of humanity. As he says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We all have sinned. To be dealt with in our life. Jesus is the adequate atonement for that sin that separates us from God. As we know it in Isaiah 59, 1-2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. This is why sin needs to be taken care of. This is why we need to acknowledge sin for what it is and, and repent of our sin and, and turn to the provision that God has made. You see, God has loved in spite of and despite man, uh, humanity's rebellion and sin. That alone reveals how great God's love is. God is not uh, like the view of, of some gods who need to be appeased of their anger, but who truly loves with the desire for humanity to respond to his love. He desires to forgive and himself has provided the means for forgiveness. 
Remember the timing of the provision is all noted in Romans chapter 5 and verses 6 through 8 where we read, for while we were still sinners, excuse me, for while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Though God is to receive the glory and God is to be glorified, we need to see how all that he has done has not been for his sake, but for our sake. Not for his own sake, but for our sake. Yes, it is for his name's sake that God is acknowledged uh, above all because he is like no other and forgives like no other. And his son is like no other in his willingness to give himself on our behalf. But this great love is also marked by it being universally extended. Note Matthew 5, 43 to 45, where we read, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. You know, though not all humanity acknowledges God as the giver of these things, God is, and by his love, he, he provides. What would it be like if he withheld his reins? What would it be like if he withheld the oxygen that we breathe? You know, God has lovingly provided for that which is needed to sustain life physically, but also to sustain it spiritually if he will be acknowledged and, and turned to as the provider uh, of it. He so loved the world that he gave. Hope and salvation has been extended to the world. It is not limited to some elite group. And Nicodemus, as a Pharisee, needed to understand this. But this salvation is limited by man's unbelief or by man's refusal, humanity's refusal to believe. God has not written off humanity in spite of the sinfulness that we see in the world, hope is still held out, at least for, for now, at least for today, because we are not assured of, of tomorrow. But for now is a revealing that God is offering hope and an opportunity for the hope that is in Christ. God so loved, great love, to meet our great need of dealing adequately with our sin. And this reflects God's great desire. And as we read in John 3, 17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Not to condemn, but to provide the opportunity for salvation. To condemn, that's the result of unbelief. That is the result of one's own rejection of the truth. Jesus came so that the world could be brought out from under the sentence of condemnation. But to reject the Son is to reject life. As we know in, in 1 John chapter 5, and verses 11 through 12, and this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. See, that, that reflects what Jesus himself said in, in John 14, 6, I am the way of the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the means of salvation that has been pro provided for us. He was not sent to condemn, but and he didn't come to condemn, but to provide for salvation through Jesus. Such is the will of our Father. In John chapter 6 and verses 38 to 40, on an occasion when Jesus was, was discussing things with the group there, we read there, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will 
of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Again, reflecting God's desire to bring salvation to humanity. You see, God delights not in retribution, but in repentance and return and provides that opportunity. In Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 23, we read God's words here where he says, the, Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, and not rather that he should turn from his way and live. You know, though some have viewed God as an angry God just waiting to, to squish humanity with a mighty thumb when he is sinful or, or throw his bolts of lightning uh, at humanity, we see that God's great desire is really to save. And he has provided that opportunity to turn to him, to turn to God's way, and therefore be able to live. And it remains the, the divine will. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. There Peter wrote, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. That is God's desire. God's goodness has been exercised with our greatest good in mind. It is not in our punishment that God delights, but in humanity's repentance and return. And as his love has been extended, it's been extended with the hope that that love would be responded to. Verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of of the only Son of God. To believe or not to believe is the choice. And to be condemned or to not to be condemned is in the choice. See, in Christ, that condemnation is removed. As Paul encouraged writing to the church at Rome in Romans 8 and verses 1 through 2, where he says, there, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Paul was saying there that that is the present condition, not what is to come, but the present condition in Christ. There is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But we must believe in who Jesus is and accept him as he is couple statements that John makes in, in his letter in, in 1 John. 1 John chapter 2, verses 22 to 23, he says, Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. We see it very clear here that not only is the Father to be acknowledged, but the Son must be acknowledged. Not only God, but Jesus, the Son, must be acknowledged. And then 1 John 4, 2 through 3. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Jesus came in the flesh. We noted that as we, we looked in, in, first John, in John chapter 1 as, as John was introducing the Messiah there. In John 1, 14, that the word became flesh and, and dwelt uh, among us. He was Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus came in the flesh and he lived amongst humanity and he gave his life in the flesh for us, shed his blood on our behalf that through the power of his blood we would have the cleansing of our sins, the adequate cleansing of our sins. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life or eternal life. We need to believe in him. So what does it mean to believe? 
The Greek pistuo, translated believe, is to believe and also to be persuaded of and hence to place confidence in, trust to trust. And it signifies in this sense of the word reliance upon, not mere credence, according to uh, W. E. Vine's expository dictionary of New Testament words, conveying the idea of reliance upon, not mere credence, not merely verbal acknowledgement, but surrender to him and acknowledging the need that we have for him. You see, it's not merely intellectual. Remember what James pointed out in James chapter 2, 17 to 19. He says, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. But is there any transformation? Is there any change there? You know, they, they believe there was acknowledgement. But there was not change in the life. There needs to be a transformation. There needs to be repentance. There needs to be a change in the acknowledgement. Not just, not just merely an intellectual acknowledgement of who Jesus is. Do you believe who Jesus is? Do you believe that he can save you? Is this belief externalized and internalized? Does it come from within us and impact our life in a very visible way? Consider two questions. What renders a radiation suit beneficial? In order for it to provide protection, it has to be put on. It has to be worn. Another question, what renders medication beneficial? It has to be internalized. It has to be taken, it has to be put within the body in order for it to do its work in the body and on behalf of the body. So consider that in, in connection with Christ also. In Galatians chapter 3, and verses 26 to 27, here Paul wrote, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We must put on Christ. Jesus had just talked with Nicodemus about the need of being born again. We need to be clothed in, in Christ. We need to die to sin and be buried in the waters of baptism and rise to that new life as Paul addresses it in Romans uh, chapter 6 and, and verses 3. And, and four, there is the need to be, to, to put on Christ and to wear Christ. And then Romans 8, verses 9 through 11, there we read, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal, mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. There is something internal here. Jesus within. The spirit within. We need to put on Christ but Christ also needs to be in us. And so we see that connection through and through that we are to have with Christ. Believing is an intellectual acknowledgement based on the evidence regarding Jesus' teachings and his works. You know, many witnessed what Jesus did, but did not believe the signs that he did. Believing it's an impact outwardly revealed through our life actions and choices and the revealing that we are in need of God and in need of God's provision. How do we acknowledge the Christ? Are we duly, duly acknowledging him for who he is in our life? In Matthew chapter 16, 
Jesus asked his disciples a question. In verses 13 to 16 we read, now, When Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of of the living God. Oh, there are still many opinions today as to who Jesus is. But it's important for us to come down to the reality of who, or the personal nature of who do we say that he is. It doesn't matter what others might say, who do we say that he is? How are we acknowledging Jesus? Are we acknowledging him as the Christ? the Son of the living God? Are we acknowledging Him as the means of our salvation? Are we acknowledging Him as the, the begotten Son of God whom He sent, that through Him we would not perish but have everlasting life? Have you confessed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Is your life demonstrating the acknowledgement of His Lordship? Believing is obeying. Believing is, is not just saying he is the Christ, but it is obeying him as the Christ, as the sovereign Lord over our life. We are to wear him. He is to be in us. He is, in a sense, to become our very life as the one who gives us eternal life. May we truly believe in making him our life. United with him in baptism to rise and walk in a brand new life in him. As, as a new creation, as anyone who is in Christ is a new creation, let that mark our life. Let others see the lordship of Christ by the manner in which we live.